with the uh, the video and the <clears throat> audio you have to drop off the video so that you get a better you know what i mean call right audio so yeah but you've probably gotten very proficient with all this i would say huh getting there yes yeah and then didn't you say you had never met your boss i have not <laughs> <laughs> and you so you got this job right before covid right and yeah so, i know. feel like I mean, he's been with the company a long time as I have, but I've never met him ever. <clears throat> so um, I will meet him hopefully one of these days. It'll be a year. And yeah. And he told me that like way back when he said, we probably won't meet for at least a year. I'm like, okay. Yep. Well, he knew, didn't he? I, you he know, knew, but at least you know what he looks like. Right. So yeah. Yeah. And all. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I think it's a few minutes after seven. So I think we'll start, we'll start our little presentation here. We have an action packed program tonight, and I really want to thank everyone for coming. It really was a great response. And um, I, I think in large part, maybe because everybody's thinking about travel, which is, which is, you know, great. We've got a lot of good things to share here. So this is how the program's generally going to run tonight. I'm going to begin by presenting a snapshot of highlighted destinations, calling out their uniqueness. But this is a snapshot, you know. And um, then we have a client presenter, which is always my favorite part. This is Karen. And Karen Grabinski is going to talk about a cruise that she was on. And this has some real significance because <laughs> she'll tell you about it. This is a cruise that disembarked in Auckland, New Zealand, right before COVID hit. So um, she's got a lot to talk about there. And then John, uh, John, you all know John, he'll discuss our most recent adventure. And uh, then we're going to follow up with an overview of the bucket list. And then we'll talk about the status of travel today. I know everybody's got that on their mind. So some housekeeping items. Uh, your videos have been turned off to enhance the presentation quality. Uh, so for best viewing, you might wanna minimize all non-video participants with your thumbnails. And because you're muted, I'm very much welcoming comments as I always do in questions. So be sure you get that chat going. I see we've already got some, some fun chat. And uh, so any questions, comments, please use your chat and we'll be monitoring that and definitely try to get to everything there. Uh, this is being recorded and it's going to be up on the website in a few days. So no need to take notes, we'll have it all for you. All right, so um, let's see, I'm going to stop my video. All right, so here is the first snapshot. And this is Finland, beautiful Finland. And uh, I just wanted to highlight the Northern Lights. Many of you know what it is, you may not, but it's a, a spectacular light show. It's called the Aurora Borealis and it could be um, viewed in these cool little glass igloos, which you see at the top left there, or you could have luxury suites if you're not inclined to stay in an igloo. And they're visible, these lights are visible 200 nights a year in Finnish Lapland. And if you look at the top right, uh, I'm, I'm a big map person. You're going to get tired of by the end of this. But anyway, the top right, you're going to see Lapland. And uh, that's by the Arctic Circle. That is the best viewing. And March, like right around now, is just an awesome time to be there. Um, but if you just aren't really, you know, wanting cold because you're from Chicago and you say, I don't want to do cold, Finland is absolutely beautiful. And the best time to go on my recommendation would be April and May. And a fast fact is that Finnish saunas are quite the rage mm -hmm. and they're entwined in the natural culture. And it's very common people have saunas in their homes, there's the parks and uh, most Finns do this once a week. It's a cherished ritual. They invite their friends, their guests, and it's normal for all the family to go to the sauna together. So that's, that's Finland. All right, the next is Thailand. And this is in Southeast Asia, 
which uh, at the beginning of my career, for those of you who followed me, I, I went to, to Southeast Asia at least once a year. I, I, I absolutely loved it. So Thailand is a um, beautiful, beautiful country. You see where all the, the countries around it, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, Vietnam, Indonesia. So it's rich in culture. But what I want to highlight is what's called the Water Festival. And um, it's crazy. And if you look on the top left, this is happening in all of the streets of, you know, your cities, Bangkok, Chiang Mai, and people just have huge hoses and are spraying one another. And it's a celebration to mark the start of the Buddhist New Year, which is April 13th through 15th. So if you really want to go to the water festival, you, you know, you have to plan this, but um, that's just a fun, fun thing. And uh, again, you'll see the map at the top, right? Most people will go to Bangkok. They'll, that's the great international airport. And you go up to Chiang Mai or Chiang Rai, and then probably head down to um, Koh Samui or Phuket, the beautiful, beautiful islands down there. And uh, best time, November to early April. And uh, you see the, the, the beautiful Bangkok at, at the bottom right. And um, Thailand, fun fact, don't disrespect the monarchy, which is, it's illegal and you could get arrested. They're really serious about it there. And so you can't deface monuments or anything that bears the king's image. So they take it seriously there. All right, the next is Germany, Munich, Oktoberfest. And it's a 16 to 18 day festival. Um, and, and remember that it really starts in September. I years back went and didn't even realize I was in September, didn't you know, realize that, hey, we're already into Oktoberfest. So it's through the first week in October and um, th that's on the left. You can see it's, it's, it's a crazy, crazy time, but uh, absolutely fun. I thought night was something I don't know that I would do again, but during the day, it's a lot of fun. And I wanted you to see the map on the right, because if you look at Germany, you will see the, the beautiful countries that you can visit when you're in Germany. And, it make, and it's so easy because you can fly, you can, you can take the rail. So you've got Poland, the Czech Republic, Austria, France. You could do like five countries, you know, within 12 days, depending on how much you like to move. So the best time is shoulder season and that's spring and fall. Those are the times I would truly recommend. And it is as beautiful as you see at the bottom right. So um, let's see, what's my fun fact here? Oh, Berlin, Berlin at the top. If you see that at the top, it's booming. And it's now the country's number one tourist magnet. It's full of history and charm. Uh, it's got a rebellious attitude. So I thought that was a fun comment and very true. So that's Berlin. And then we're gonna head back to Asia. And uh, something I wanted to highlight was Japan. Um, it's a it's a it's a big country. It's a narrow country, and so this map um, really shows you that you know you've just got a lot of ground to cover. And uh, many people, I wanted to highlight the cherry blossoms because that's a beautiful time to be in Japan, and that's going to be in April, and it's it's a high time. So if you're going to go, you know, book it in advance. And uh, so top left, you see the cherry blossoms, and then this is the fall. So every season, it's just really spectacular. And then my map is going to show, that shows you the golden triangle. That's what people will oftentimes do, you know, the first time to Japan, or maybe the only time, because it's really far for us, right? So, you know, you do Tokyo, you Mount Fuji, Hakonoe, Kyoto, you could, you know, Hiroshima, you could, you can, you can do a lot, you know, and it all depends on your interest, but this is the golden triangle. Well, most people will want to visit when they're going to Japan. And again, I have best times for you, March to May and September to November. And a fact that I wanted to say about the Japanese people, don't be surprised or alarmed if someone stops and asks you if you need help. It's frequently, it occurs with 
visitors, you know, we Americans, we were like, oh, what, what do they, what do they want? And they're just, they, they know we're confused. They just want to help. So they're, they're really awesome people. All right. So you have had enough of me for a little bit. And I want to uh, introduce you to our, well, she's a client and a wonderful friend, Karen Grabinski. And uh, she's, She's got a lot to say about cruising. She she loved her experience, so I asked her right away, okay, would you mind presenting? And probably not so happy with that, but she said, sure. So Thanks, I'm going to have Karen take yeah. it over, but could you please put any of your questions and your comments in chat? Thank you, Kathy. And again, my name is Karen Gubinski, and I've had the pleasure of going on actually, I think, three group trips with both um, John and Kathy. But in addition to that, they've also planned a lot of our family trips as well. All wonderful trips, um, one better than the other. But last February, my husband and I got to check off two places to visit that were on our bucket list. And those were Australia and New Zealand. For him, he had both of those locations on his list. For me, it was more Australia, as you can see in this picture here. I mean, gorgeous, gorgeous, the Sydney Opera House. We're gonna start off with just a little video. So um, Kathy, can you run that video, please? Your journey starts beneath southern skies, where glacier and ocean meet, a land where giant eagles once guarded the skies, where streams that run hot feed rivers that run cold, and where warrior princesses know how to warm your heart, where metal hawks soar. You can dine above the clouds. where wizards turn water into wine, and sea creatures walk on land, and where you can play on mountains protected by gods. It's a place that will forever keep you under its spell. Traveler, your dreams are waiting. Thanks, Kathy. Um, hopefully you guys enjoyed that um, short uh, video. And, and truthfully, as beautiful as those pictures were, it really doesn't do it justice. Um, we began actually our journey last year with a pre-cruise stay in Sydney, where we got to visit the Sydney Opera House. Um, we went to Bondi Beach. We went on a city tour. We had cocktails at a rooftop hotel bar, the Shangri-La. We did a sunset cruise compliments of Virtuosa, Kathy and John. And then there was the famous Bay Bridge, as you can see, upper, um, upper center, where several members of our group climbed to the top. Um, Kathy and John did. Um, I myself did not, being a little claustrophobic and afraid of heights. But that is something for those of you who are really into doing something that you know is a highlight. Uh, and Sydney, you really need to do that. Um, could you um, change the screen next? Okay, then we then boarded the Region 7 Seas Navigator. And I want to talk a little bit about this because it's a 490 passenger and a 340 crew cruise ship. And the process was very, very efficient. And, and I want you to remember something um, as I talk about the Seven Seas Navigator. And I'm going to use an acronym. I'm going to use the word cruise. And I'm going to start off with the letter C. I mean, obviously, right? C is for convenience. And although most cruises can say this, we really felt that region's ports of call, again, another C there, were unique with desirable locations to visit. And you can see here on the map, and Kathy had mentioned how she loves maps. Um, we got to visit Napier, and Wellington, and Auckland, and Tauranga, and the island of Tasmania. I mean, how many people can say that they've been to Tasmania? Right? <laughs> And really great is we got to see a variety of locations with the possibility of returning to your favorite location at a different time. And you can do all of this without having to move your suitcases from location to location, hence very convenient. Now, some people may say, well, one day in each of these spots isn't enough time for me. And I say, oh, I'm, you know, I, I say contrary to that, what's great about it is if you don't like a place, you don't have to go back to it. You're not stuck in that one location. But if you love a place, like my husband loved Wellington, 
we can go back hopefully sometime in the future and spend maybe four days to a week there and then go to another one of our, our, our favorite ports of call. Um, the other thing, and Kathy, if you can move the slide again. Um, and again, this was just the embarkation um, and we'll get to this relaxation. We're gonna hold for a few minutes here because I'm gonna talk a little bit about you know, while you're on board, you're going to enjoy, and we really enjoyed Milford Sound, which is one of New Zealand's natural attractions. It's a glacier car fjord with mountain cliffs and waterfalls. And again, pictures just didn't do it justice. It was magnific magnificent. And that was one of my favorite things about the cruise, in addition to, um, well, I had a lot of favorite places actually, but that was really a favorite, I would say, place um, that we got to see. In Wellington, one can visit Lord of the Rings, that film locations or the various filming locations. Rotorua, and I'm probably pronouncing it incorrectly, is the key center of Maori culture. Napier is known for its fine wine. So from one day to the next, you can see kangaroos and koalas. You can indulge in cheese, chocolate, or wine um, excursions. You can go kayaking, or you can be a part of a wildlife safari. And one of the things that I really enjoyed was punting on the Avon in, in, in Christchurch. That was a lot of fun. Now, R in cruise stands for relaxation. And all you have to do is ask, and everything is provided for you from 24-hour room service to premium alcohol to the health club, swimming pool, spa services, evening entertainment. And if I haven't sold you already, I'm hopefully by the time we're done, I will. Um, crossword puzzles on every level, lecture series. There's just enough things to do to keep you busy when you're on board. You is for unique ports of call, as I mentioned. And the ratio is one to one passengers to crew members. Now, for those of you who are mathematicians or really into math, to be exact, it's 0.7. So it's a 0.7 ratio of crew member to passenger, which is exceptional. And there's also a small enough number of passengers and that whether you're traveling as a couple or in a group, you never feel alone. You know, you can make long lasting relationships. And I say that because you see these people over and over again while you're on the cruise, knowing that there's only like 450 of them. So you really kind of get to know them. It's an intimate kind of setting. I is for innovative and informative. Innovative in that it's all inclusive. In fact, the first night my husband requested a bottle of fine cognac for the room. I was a little worried about that to be honest with you. Um, he expected a small bottle, but he was given this giant bottle that could last a month. Um, luckily, he didn't finish it. Um, but the point is you ask and they provide the best. Informative in that several excursions would, uh, were offered and the lecture series that they provided were interesting and relevant to the ports of call that you were gonna visit. Um, the excursions offered range from relaxing, which I liked, to historical, which I also liked, to exercise related, which had a nice range of options, whether you're into physically demanding excursions or to more sedentary ones. Now, I personally enjoyed, you know, the historical tours. I enjoyed the wine vineyard tours, walking through the various towns to get to know the New Zealand lifestyle, not to mention shopping for unique items, right? And, you know, one thing I learned is that if you see something that you like, you better buy it because when you come back to the States and try to order it, unfortunately, they do not um, send it to um, the United States from Australia. S is for service. And as I mentioned, they try to accommodate your every need. So one thing worth mentioning is um, you definitely want to sign up and Kathy would help you with this in advance for any tours and for the specialty restaurant or you'll miss out because of the small number of, you know, people who are on board and everybody wants to sign up for certain, um, you know, certain of these excursions over others, but there's enough to choose from. And E is for entertaining. So whether you're into the casino, yes, they did have a casino on board, doing puzzles almost on every floor, attending the nightly showcase, which was wonderful, going to the cocktail lounges where people, you know, were dancing with one another or with their significant other, playing cards, or just being a part of like trivia contests. They had that as well. So in summary, there is something for everyone to enjoy. And so what I want you to remember is the following. Cruise, the word cruise, stands for convenience with unique ports of call, R for relaxation, U, a unique experience, I, informative and innovative, S for service, and E for entertainment. And that was what the Seven Seas Navigator offered to my husband and I. Thank you. Any questions? I'm, I'd be free to answer them. If you well, guys have Karen, that was fantastic. You know, it was, um, 
such a great experience and I just relived it as you told it. So how many, how, did you say how many days it was? Um, it was, how many days were we out there? It was almost like two weeks, wasn't it, Kim? Yeah, yeah it was, I think, well, I think it was 17. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, we, we cruised for 17 and we were in Sydney for two nights. So it was like um, total. And it was a wonderful three weeks. And at first I thought, oh, being on a cruise ship for that long a period of time may be too long, but it really wasn't. Like I said, there was something to see, something to do every day. And here, Kathy has some pictures that, you know, she's showing of Akaroa. Um, there was also like a train trip that, you know, my husband and I had gone on. Um, some people, I mean, everybody kind of did something a little bit differently, depending upon, you know, what their needs were. Again, some people are more active, did the kayaking. I think, Kathy, you did the kayaking as well. Um, last, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, Karen, to your point there. So, so they have, they give you a lot of excursions to choose from, from each port, you know, you might have like eight choices and it's really nice. Didn't you like that? I mean, you could really customize yeah. it to what you wanted to do. And just because we were a group, we all did different things. Yes. Yes. And if you've done some of those things in the past and you don't, you know, you didn't want to participate, like in, you see the bottom right. Um, with the sheep, um, I'm, I'm thinking it's kind of small there, but I think those are sheep, right? Yeah, they're I had, sheep. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I, I couldn't, I couldn't tell. It's so small on my iPhone. Um, but you know, I had done that already when we went to Scotland, so I decided to skip out on that. But um, you know, that everyone who did that thought it was a wonderful experience. Um, the one little tr trivia um, that I forgot to mention, piece of trivia, is that in the city of Sydney. No one lives more than three miles away from the water. Mm. And so from every vantage point in Sydney, you can see the water. I mean, it is, it is a magnificent, beautiful city. That's a great yeah. Cruise tour. And then of course the Sydney opera house with this architecture, we took a tour of it. And um, I'm trying to think of who the actress is, who's won many Academy Awards. Um, Nicole Kidman? Kidman worked there when she was a young girl to get into um, theater. Um, they had mentioned that as well. So, you know, some really neat, you know, little pieces of trivia that you pick up along the way, but just a wonderful experience. And those three days that we were there, um, you know, I thought we really did a lot of activity um, in a three day period of time. So yeah. I didn't feel like No, go ahead, Kim. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. And, and again, you know, that's the place that I would like to go back to. Now we ended our cruise in Auckland. Um, and again, you know, that's something that, you know, I think another location that I would like to go back to. Um, but we were kind of lucky in that, you know, COVID was starting in what last December, last January. And so, you know, the cruise continued obviously. Um, and if we had stayed in Auckland, obviously we would not have made it back into the United States in time. So it, it just worked out that um, we all made it back right before they closed the borders. Um, but that didn't, that did not um, impede our vacation. Um, we had, we had a great time and got to see a lot of things. And in fact, you know, we wouldn't have traveled um, at all this year if we hadn't, or I should say in 2020, if we hadn't taken that trip. So it was definitely. Yeah. So, so Karen, um, how was the weather? Um, the weather was very good. Um, I mean, we had, um, I would say it was moderate weather. When we were in Sydney, we had some warm days, I remember. And then, of course, when you're, you know, on the boat, I mean, there were some cooler days, but I would say the weather was like, a, it was like springtime. Um, I can't recall, but I would say 70 and 80s, right, Kath? Not so bad, was it? No. Because no. <laughs> we, we were from Chicago, you know, February in Chicago. Right. Is, is just a, not such a good thing, but um, certainly worth the flight. And this Bay of Islands, um, see, you have to get, again, folks, get your maps out. There's a North and a South Island, and this is a three hour drive North of Auckland where we ended up. So we actually passed Auckland, went to the Bay of Islands, which I, which I loved. And um, then, you know, we can't, wasn't, wasn't a cruise a great way to do this, Karen? Yes. And like I said, I think it's just a convenient way to see so many different places in a short period of time. 
And if you're interested, then you can go back, um, you know, as opposed to if we had just picked one or two locations and it had spent the majority of our time there, we wouldn't have gotten to see all these other locations that we would have missed out on and definitely would have wanted to go back to. Um, and again, now these are pictures of Auckland. Um, and again, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a must see. It's definitely a place that you would want to go back to. Um, and, you know, this could have been a post cruise kind of excursion. Um, I don't know if anybody extended their stay. I know more people did the pre cruise um, excursion, the three days versus the post. Um, but again, this is a location that I, I know I would definitely want to go back to as, as does my husband. Yeah, it, it was something we considered, but honestly, we were, we're talking 19 days already. And, <laughs> you know, I, I think some people are actually talking about, you know, renting something and staying out there for, you know, six weeks. But um, one of the things, Karen, we did not get to, I tried, I couldn't do it. Wahiki Island at the top right mm -hmm. is a ferry from downtown Auckland. It's a ferry ride. And it's an absolutely must visit. There's beautiful vineyards and, um, you know, some really cool beaches. And so anybody, if anybody's heading out to Auckland, how many nights would you say, Karen? Um, I would say at least three, you know, four days, three nights. You know, I think, you know, to get a feel for the city, I mean, you can extend it, but I think you can do justice with the, the three nights, four days, definitely. Yes. So, yeah. So beautiful, beautiful cruise, beautiful memories. And particularly because we ended it, you know, right before COVID and we, you know, were able to have um, vacations right to the very end, weren't we? Right. And the one thing, you know, I kind of laugh, I think all of you have seen the movie planes, trains and automobiles, right? Well, when I think of my Australia trip and my New Zealand, New Zealand trip, I think of planes, trains, automobiles, Ubers, cruise boat, a tram, an aerial tram, a train. Um, let's see what else. Um, the the uh, destination cruise. I mean, it was just, I mean, we did it all. Kayaking. So I think kayaks. So the list goes on and on. So I, I laugh every time I see planes, trains, and automobiles. Mm -hmm. you know, on because I mean we definitely did it all. All right. Well, that that was really super, Karen. I, I can't thank you enough. And um, uh, if you want to come on back, you know, toward the end, that would be great. But we're going to move on now, and I'm just going to finish up with just a few snapshots of highlighted destinations. And this one, everybody knows, this is beautiful Italy. And I remember. You know, always, you know, the boot is what makes it so, so representative. And there's something called the Palio di Siena. It's a horse race that's held twice each year, July 2nd and August the 16th in Siena, Italy. And, you know, we went to Siena and we had a, a guide talk to us about this. And it's a competition between neighborhoods and there are no rules. It's crazy. And everyone, um, it, from the minute it ends, to the next, you know, July 1st, I mean, they're all about this race and the neighborhood have certain colors, there are tradition. And this is all it, it, thanks to the Madonna for protecting them from one of the wars in the late 1400s. So believe it or not, this, this race <laughs> is one minute and they take three turns around the, the very big plaza you can see on the left, those are people. And people rent out their balconies for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. It's, it's just a major thing. So that, and, and Italy there, you could do five or six vacations. And I'm happy to talk to you about that. Um, but a fun fact for Italy, do remember that most of Italy has a three and a half hour break, generally between 1.30 and 4.30 p.m. when most businesses and shops close down. Now that's, they're doing that less and less, but they, they love their free time and many shops are closed on Sunday. So if I send clients there, I have to be careful about Sunday. Um, and the next is Morocco. And I wanted to highlight what's called the Oasis Music Festival. And it's held every September for three days. And, you know, most of us don't know Morocco well, but these people are crazy about their music. 
and it, it, it's held in Marrakesh and um, the, the face is the Atlas Mountains, the beautiful, so it's, it's got a great venue. And so you, you enjoy the beautiful landscape and you dance to live music. These people are just fun partiers. And it features international talent, famous DJ, DJs from all over the world. And it's really, um, you know, quite well known out that way. So I um, wanted to bring up Morocco and you see that map up there, uh, Spain, right to, to the north of it. And there is a ferry that goes between Gibraltar, Spain uh, to Tangier, Morocco. It's an hour and a half ferry. I, I did it with Kirsten and we both got, you know, the, the, the seas were rough and they are not usually that rough, but, um, but we did an hour and a half. We're in a totally different country. Very, very cool experience. So that is Morocco. And uh, the last is Amsterdam. And the way we, most of us know Amsterdam is that you go on a river cruise, you know, you're going to pre or you're going to post there. It's probably three or four nights. I've had clients go to the beautiful um, Netherlands in the spring where you have the famous tulips. I had a client just go there for like four nights and it was um, two years ago uh, um, in April and, and they had a fabulous time and the colors truly do look that way. And the best time to go is mid-April to mid-October. You don't have the hot, you know, summers because of, you know, where they're at. So it's just, uh, just quite a beautiful place to be. And uh, please, this is a tip: take a take a boat ride because it's the city is loveliest when you are on the water and uh, don't get in the way of the bicycle paths, which I accidentally did, because if you value your life, these people are not looking out for you. They have the right of way. So that is Amsterdam. All right, so the next we have um, where John and I were just, it seems like a long time ago, but it was only a month ago in, uh, San Miguel. And what I want to remind you all of is to please put your questions and comments in the chat because that's 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 really um, helpful for us to understand, you know, what what you may want us addressing that we may not be. So um, John, are you there? I am Kathy, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks again uh, for joining us this evening uh, for another episode of Where Has Kathy Been Lately? and uh, of course, another map. The uh, last excursion, is, as Kathy mentioned, was south of the border. Mexico has been very welcoming to US tourists and it's a great climate for a uh, February getaway. We were also intrigued by San Miguel de Aliando because they have uh, several luxury hotels, um, including two that are virtuoso that we were very interested in seeing firsthand, or at least that's the excuse we gave ourselves to have to get away from Chicago in February. So as you can see on the map, um, San Miguel de Alianda is in the center of Mexico. And in fact, its nickname is the heart of Mexico. And it's got that nickname for that reason, it's in the center, but also it was the center of Mexicans independence battle with Spain and their subsequent um, independence thereof. Uh, it's a center for art and beauty. It's, it's really a, a city that I hadn't had much knowledge of previously and uh, learned a lot in a very positive way. So location wise, it's in the center. It's about three hours north of Mexico City. And we flew into Cuerto, which is just about less than an hour uh, from door to door into San Miguel. So on the next slide, um, you, you start out by knowing that this, given its location, is not a Mexican beach vacation. But this is a, a city that's rich in history, a lot of colorful buildings, Spanish colonial architecture. And it's actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, which I wouldn't have picked to be in the center of Mexico. This is uh, the city center, and it's dominated by the Church of San Miguel in the center. And that's surrounded by shops and restaurants and beautiful park area right in the front there, Il Jardin. And throughout um, San Miguel, you find cobblestone streets as you can see in the upper left-hand photo. And that really kind of put a crimp in 
one of our plans. We like to bike through some of these places, but cobblestone streets and some of the hills that they had there just didn't make that uh, possible this time around. So on the next slide, um, I wanna share with you where we stayed. This is the, uh, the Belmont property. So there are two um, virtuoso properties, as I mentioned. One is the Belmont and the other is Rosewood. And both of those are well-known brands throughout the world. Uh, this property is, is one that um, in, our, in the case of our room, uh, it is uh, with an outdoor patio, an outdoor fireplace, a walking distance from the pool, and certainly covered with a lot of trees and foliage throughout. So it was a, it was a real oasis from the city. As you walked out the door, you had traffic, but when you were inside uh, the hotel uh, compound, it was uh, a world unto itself. They had multiple restaurants and a great bar, but the thing that I thought was really a plus about it was five minutes away was the city center. It was a five minute walk. So it was very convenient to everything. Um, this is a town that has a lot of shops, a lot of restaurants, and so there's a lot to do when you're down there. On the next slide, um, just to show you uh, the, the view from the street on the left, you can see the cobblestone streets. But one thing that struck me when we were there is that the buildings all were very colorful, different colors as you walk down each street, and the doors were artistic in nature. And in fact, every time you'd open a door into one of the areas, it was a courtyard usually. And there were either shops or restaurants or hotels, and you'd escape from the street and be in the middle of a courtyard, much like you'd find yourself if you were in a European city. And that's what struck me is that here we are in Mexico and it had some of the same sort of feel to it as if you were walking through Germany or Italy or Spain. They're also, as I said, known for art. And one of the discoveries we had is a place called the Aurora Center, like Aurora, Illinois. And there they had the equivalent of a merchandise mart set up. And it was expansive and very well done with pottery, art, uh, tapestries, paintings, lots and lots of uh, things to choose from. Thankfully, we didn't have much room in our suitcase, but uh, we did manage to get some things back to the States with us. On the right is the Rosewood Hotel rooftop. And this is the other virtuoso property. And as you can see, uh, from the distance of their rooftop bar, the church steeple is off um, on the horizon. And it's a great spot to, uh, to relax in. The hotel itself has multiple restaurants, two bars, and really extensive outdoor common areas to relax and enjoy yourself. So on the next slide, let me give you a look at Rosewood at night. So the, again, uh, the Rosewood bar is in the inset up at the top. Um, we found ourselves there more nights than not for the sunset. And as you see in the both pictures, the steeple for San Miguel has the cross lit up at night. And after, um, after sunset, you'd see the city lights start to come on. And it was really a pretty picture from a, a vantage point like that. Okay, so then on to the next slide, we, uh, we, we did have to take part in uh, some Mexican cuisine and we didn't do a bad job of that. But the discovery I had was um, a couple of pictures here in the front and the right and the left were bakeries. And every morning we made our way to find some fresh baked pastries. And um, they, were, they were fantastic. In the background, there's a view of the Benito Juarez Park, which is located in the city and it's walking distance from both of the hotels and it has trails and ponds, flowers, activity space. So it was really a great respite from the, uh, the streets in the city. We, uh, we found ourselves walking there on a daily basis, most probably because the bakery calories had to find a way to get worked off. <laughs> By the way, um, we did find a Starbucks, but it was not open at 5 a.m. So that was much to Kathy's dismay. Anyways, let me move on to the next slide. Um, so our best meal that we had on the trip, I'm highlighting here, and that was the cooking class that we took with the Belmont Hotel Chef. This was private. And you know, what we found as we traveled this year is a lot of excursions are private. Um, because of COVID, that's the way that uh, most properties run things. And so this was a great opportunity, um, although the chef had to be very patient with, with me. Um, it started out with a walk to the market um, and uh, there we, we shopped for fresh ingredients, which included vegetables, fruit. There was a little lady by 
a door, doorway that we bought fresh tortillas from, um, homemade ice cream, and all this we, we brought back to um, a private kitchen. And um, Kathy was the main cook um, for most of it, starting out with the appetizer of fresh guacamole and tortillas, and then a paella dish of chicken, rice, and cheese, and a tomato sauce there at the lower left-hand side. They had a strange way of, uh, of cooking the corn and the, uh, and the peppers. They put it right on top of the, uh, the stove, but it worked out fine. And um, we really, really enjoyed that uh, experience. And the chef actually gave us his recipe. So um, ping Kathy if you want to get a little bit more about his, uh, his recipes. And also, he's got a YouTube uh, class that he puts on for short uh, easy to make meals in less than 15 minutes. So that might be a worthwhile thing to look at as well. All right, let me turn to the next slide for one of the other adventures that we had while we were down there. And this is the picture of a um, generational uh, Mexican ranch that was home to eight different families on 500 acres. And in the lower corner here, you'll see a hat where they grow their own cowboy hats. Um, but actually, um, they were there for us to go on a horseback riding uh, adventure, and uh, we picked out a disinfected hat for each of us and did the Mexican version of a Grand Canyon descent. <laughs> on the next slide, though, um, you'll see that they, they had to put us to work before they'd allow us to do that. And if you look off to the right there, you'll see me hunched over milking a cow. And... Um, that helped me relive some childhood memories. And the memory I had was that I wasn't very good at it then and I wasn't much better now, but, um, but it was an experience and we must have passed because they took us out on the trail. You see us there on those sure-footed horses. Um, the, uh, the guides were great, although I think that they took a lot of, um, a lot of uh, advantage of the fact that the gringos really weren't that great um, horse, horsemen and horsewomen because they would have the horses gallop every once in a while. And there are no photos in there of us with that look of fear on our face, but, but there are some that exist. Um, and the reward for, um, for making it through the, uh, the ride down the canyon and back up was a home cooked meal by the guide's aunts and cousins. And that was just delicious. You know, the, the, uh, the highlight of that was that the cheese that they use was made from cow's milk and that cow's milk was uh, fresh from the morning. And so they assured me that part of what I did was contribute to the meal with that cow's milk itself. So um, that, was, that was a great experience all the way around. And as the slide says, they had, this is a location, if you ever in, are in San Miguel de Aleando, um, it's a worthwhile um, excursion to do because they do other things, hiking and cooking classes, et cetera. So we were really impressed with them. So, um, let me tell you that as I looked at this trip, it was a perfect tonic for the February freeze. As I said at the outside, I didn't know what to expect and going to a city in the center of Mexico turned out to be far above the expectations that I was thinking I would have. The, um, the couple of points I'd make in addition to what I've covered thus far is that um, it's in the same time zone, so you don't have to get your body clock uh, rearranged. The best time to go is between November and April. So our winters are great down there. And this location has been named by Travel and Leisure one of the best small cities in the world. And that's quite a compliment. And they are not, um, they're very critical with what they, they award places to. So um, in the end, when I uh, was leaving, I asked the concierge why he thought it was called the heart of Mexico. And he, uh, he came back with a different answer than what I had said earlier. And that was that, it steals the heart of everyone who visits San Miguel. And after having experienced it myself, I'd agree and I'd find my way back there again if, if there is an opportunity. Kathy, back to you. Well, I mean, that was great, John. We obviously, we lived that through that together, but um, boy, much needed. I can't tell you how much I look forward, you know, to doing something in February when our weather here in Chicago is just not so great. What was the what wasn't the weather like 70, 80, sunny? I mean, this these are real pictures here. Yeah, what was what was interesting was the mornings um, 
um, were, were cool. And it, it got really warm, like at four or five o'clock in the afternoon. And we found that, you know, it, it kept getting warmer as the day went on, as opposed to thinking about high noon being when it's the warmest time. But uh, yeah, the weather was perfect. It was, there was no rain, not a drop of water. And, um, and uh, it was a, a great way to be outside and enjoy the fresh air. Yeah, and the, and that rooftop really is is a beautiful find, and I'm going to also tell you that um, you know the COVID um, it, it it was crowded but not super crowded. You know you could still get in, but my concern would be you know during normal times it would be very very difficult to get a spot there at sunset. So, um, but but John, I maybe. You know, I didn't ask you this in advance, but would you pair it? What would you pair this with? Is there, this is in central. What would you pair this with? Well, this, is, this would be great to go with someplace like Cabo, a, a beach vacation or somewhere on the coast. So a little time on the, in the uh, sun and fun and then um, some brain and, and other sort of historical food to, to feed your, yourself at as well. So um, and, and we were there for five days and uh, could have stayed longer and frankly wished we did. Um, you, know, you know, one thing I, I did want to touch upon, though, was you know, a lot of people talk about travel during COVID. And I could not have felt more safe there, that, more safe than I was here in the United States. Um, first of all, every shop and store we went into took my temperature <laughs> and they were all masked up and and the like. It didn't inhibit your experience, but you felt very safe about it. We had to have a COVID test to get back into the States. And they actually arranged for somebody to come to our hotel patio and take one of those rapid tests. And within three hours, we had antigen results that were able to be used to get us on the plane. Um, everything was very smooth. The one thing I liked as well is as you entered the town of San Miguel, they had roadblocks. And if you didn't have a hotel reservation or you didn't have a reason to be in that town, they weren't letting you in. So they're very, very um, particular about keeping COVID to a minimum. Um, and they didn't have a problem um, at all. They had no deaths from COVID is what we were told. So they, they were very serious about it. You know, one thing I wanna to do too, I see a, mess, a note here from, from Everett, um, as far as speaking Spanish, um, no issue. I don't speak Spanish and um, everybody was very fluent. They're used to tourists down there. It's a very, uh, in fact, what we found out is that 10% of the 70,000 people in that city are expats. It, it draws people from the United States, Canada, and uh, English speaking uh, places because of its culture, uh, community. It was, it was funny when you, we'd walk down the street, you could spot the Americans um, that live there because they had their shopping bags or they had their, their um, their computers and and they were like they were anywhere in the states just looked completely comfortable and the other thing i'd mention is we felt very safe kathy and i were walking in the evenings after dark um you know i, I didn't feel concerned at all that um you know some of the reputation that other parts of mexico may have are not present in, in this particular location from our experience yeah, no, that's that's really good. And 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 about the speaking, um, that's actually a really good question because I felt that that was kind of the charm of of this colonial town that um, they didn't they spoke enough, if you know what I mean. I mean, they could understand enough, but you couldn't really have a great conversation. And yes, I do, and I think this all the time. I wish I knew other languages because I've been able to get along perfectly fine with English, but these are sweet people. They're wonderful people. And um, I just, I really felt sad when I was leaving. I mean, I, I really felt sad. So John, that was an amazing presentation and it brought to light a lot of the very, you know, strong points of, of this adventure. Was it only four, was it four days or five nights? What, what was it five nights? We were there for uh, four for five days and four nights. Four, yeah, wow. So we we got a lot in there, but um, but you know they they checked our temperature pretty much wherever we went. But it was a real quick like just a check, so it wasn't invasive at all. And you know people did have a lot of ma they had masks on, but you know they never ever locked down. They can't lock down. They're a poor country. They can't do that to themselves. So you know they had to just learn to to deal with COVID 
and um, it, it, everything was open. People were being safe and careful. Uh, restaurants, uh, I, don't, I don't know about the bars. I think they had a curfew like by eight or nine, but, um, but anyway, well, that was a great presentation. Actually on the bar side, um, they had the bar used to close at nine, but um, they would deliver room service to you anytime you wanted. So there was never a, an excuse not to, um, to have a, a nightcap. Okay, so um, I got um, a, a, a chat message from a client and we're going back to Thailand now. Uh, she says our favorite, very emotional experience was being with the elephant for five hours in Chiang Mai. Yeah, I bathed an element, uh, an elephant in Chiang Mai very when you could do that. Um, we chose an elephant rescue center versus one where you ride them. The island Koh Samui was so fun where we did a cooking class, relaxed on the beach and shopped. Um, her daughter, she went with her daughter, great mother-daughter trip. So yeah, thanks, Kelly. That's, yeah, I loved your photos as well. So, all right, here we go. This is Wanderlust. And for many of you who um, understand our group travel, I just kind of want to highlight this. I get a lot of requests all the time and I try to email and I, you know, it's just hard, but, but, and we've had changes, you know, I mean, obviously with all that's going on here, we have changes to our, to our bucket list travel. So uh, at the very top, starting in September, 2015, I've got people on the call with you're with the inaugural Paris and Normandy River Cruise. And I have those people still traveling on the group cruises because they're, and they're not just cruises, they're adventures. Um, uh, and we'll talk about the next one coming up. But so you see the breadth of the different experiences that we've had. And um, highlighted in blue, you have Vermejo Ranch. And uh, I didn't change this. We're not going to Santa Fe. We're going to Colorado Springs. But um, with, they're equidistant, really. But that's in New Mexico. And that's, that's coming up. So John, you wanna talk a little bit about that? Cause I know you did a lot of the planning there. Sure. Um, so Vermejo is um, actually part of the Ted Turner reserve. So uh, Ted Turner who uh, started uh, TBS and CNN and, and uh, cable TV uh, in a big way became a environmentalist and he's been buying up land uh, throughout the, the country and actually outside the country. This location is where he chose to uh, settle in in order to um, reinvigorate the bison population. So this was a 600,000 acre area that um, had a handful of bison. And now he's, uh, he's had them roaming throughout the property and, um, and growing at a good rate. But the, the property itself is, is one that um, has a number of activities that guests partake in. It's not a big location. They probably have room for 50 guests, um, but it's an all-inclusive type arrangement where you're shooting and fishing and horseback riding and several other uh, activities are part of what you can do. And then meals are included. Uh, it's, a, it's a really a great resort. Kathy and I took our kids there um, uh, last year. And uh, well, I guess now it's 2019. Um, and re really a great outdoor place. And you don't have to um, think of it like a dude ranch. It's sort of like your own private national park is the way I think about it. Um, you have guides that take you all around and just experiences that um, you'll, you'll never forget. Right, so for those of you out there um, with, with families, our, our, our uh, kids were 29 and 31, and absolutely loved it. And you know, it's something really unique and, and very, very different. And it may take families um, kind of out of their comfort zone because you are out, you, you're not going out to town to a, a restaurant. I mean, you are just there on property. And we actually got to know some of the other guests who were uh, quite accomplished, so because of the smallness of it, you, you just, you know, you just, you just felt special and uh, very, very unique. You don't, you just don't forget an experience like that. So we're going in May and um, you know, that's definitely a go. 
And then uh, we have the Rhine in Switzerland, um, you know, August 2021, and um, Jordan, Egypt, and a Nile River cruise in uh, September. That's, I think, September 28th. So it's kind of later in September. And that, um, right now, those countries are open. So they're open. They're, they're taking tourists right now. Um, and then after that, uh, we've already got people deposited on the Baltic. Um, it's cruising. The, the, the itinerary I absolutely love because it's St. Petersburg, Russia, your, your um, overnight, which is, which is excellent. And then we're going to Poland, Finland, Estonia. And I'm, well, we're, co we're starting in Copenhagen, ending in Stockholm. So just, just think of all the beautiful that you're going to see. And it's just a seven night cruise. So uh, that's June, 2022. And what I want to say to everyone here, and we're going to get into this in our next quick session. Um, but I do want to say that um, I, I've done a lot of um, webinars on the cruising industry, which is coming, hopefully coming back strong. They believe that. So they're, they're talking about April 1st, they're going to be raising rates. And I, I tell everyone this because um, with the ability to have pretty good deposits and uh, some great promotions right now, I, I do see that changing as um, you know, our country opens up. So I just wanted to say that about the Baltic. And then we've already got almost a, a whole group on Spain, the, the pilgrimage, the Camino de Santiago Trail, and then Dolomites we were supposed to do in September 2020, and that was canceled. So we're looking to do that again in June 2023. So um, that's that. Okay, and then the other thing I want to bring up is um, I have a lot of questions about you know, what's going on in the travel industry. I think people are um, just, just really confused. And I don't, I, I, I totally understand why, because the situation pretty much changes just about every day. And, but I will say that the last five months have made a really, a huge difference in, in our outlook and how, how, how we're, we're taking a look at all of this. And how how it how the information I'm getting today and, and this week is that the CDC continues to discourage US citizens from traveling internationally for at least a few more months. But I will say in a positive note, more than 90 countries have reopened to tourists. So, but mostly Asia and uh, some of Europe remain off limits right now. But I do expect, as most people in this industry, that's, that's gonna change over the next you know, one or two months. M many countries in Africa are once again welcoming tourists. And in fact, John and I have just deposited on a trip uh, to Namibia in June. Namibia is by Botswana. And um, you know, it's one of those amazing countries out there. And so, so we're, we're feeling confident about that. And I, I'm seeing that the governments are easing COVID restrictions all over the world. I mean, in most places, you're going to need a negative test arriving within 72 hours. I think even Hawaii, you have to have that. Um, so that's, that's probably something you're going to have to endure. And then as of right now, coming back into the country, you're going to have to have a negative test. So, um, But Royal Caribbean, who is the second largest cruise line in the world, uh, that's Royal Caribbean, Celebrity, and Silver Sea. They're all one big group here. Uh, they have restarted their cruising, and uh, it's, it's not U.S. cruising, all right? But they have taken 100,000 guests on 150 cruises during the pandemic, and they've had only 10 people test uh, positive for COVID, and um you know, I'm sure they tested before they got on, you know, so they're, they're, they're making sure people coming on don't have COVID, but, but through their protocols and such, they have learned to handle these things smoothly. And I've been following the cruise lines for the past year. I get webinars, updates constantly. 
And I cannot tell you of a group that has taken this more seriously. They've hired panels of advisors over the, pan over the whole duration of the year to understand the problem. And um, they, they want their guests, you know, all of us to feel extremely comfortable on board. Testing has gotten better and as well as the contact tracing. So they're extremely optimistic and they are hoping, this is the hope, that in the, the, the summer, this coming summer in the US, the cruise lines can start to, to reopen. And what I will say is that people are holding space and uh, they're holding space, just, just crossing their fingers. And if, if it doesn't go, the cruise lines are being great and they're just moving these deposits with, without a problem. So another question that I get quite, I mean, I got it, yeah, I, I, every single day, will vaccines be required? And, you know, honestly, who, who knows at this stage? Um, circumstances are, are changing all of the time. And I do know that Crystal Cruise um, apparently came out and they said they're going to require that passport, that vaccine passport. And I know the Seychelles, which is an island off the coast of, uh, of East Africa has said that they do require that. And that, this was a few weeks ago. So I was waiting to see, and um, I could be wrong, but I don't think anybody has jumped on to say that they're requiring that. There's a lot of talk about it. Um, but personally, as of right now, I feel that it would be a very, very difficult uh, thing to implement because, uh, but, but if you don't have the vaccine, uh, you're, be ready to be tested before, probably during um, and, and after. So, uh, but, but who knows? Who knows where this is all going to go? And the last thing I want to bring up is um, my, my uh, TravelX insurance partner. Uh, they are coming out April 1st, and I'm, I'm listening to a webinar tomorrow actually on this, but she gave me some information. They're, they provide coverage for trip cancellation if you or your traveling companion test positive for the coronavirus and you must physically quarantine as a result. And you have to be certified um, by a physician, as you, as you can well understand. And they're also talking about if a business partner your business partner tests positive for COVID and you have to cancel your trip because you have to now, you know, be in charge, you are eligible for trip cancellation coverage. So um, that's something that I'm very happy to talk to people about as they, you know, book their trips coming up. But, but certainly they are now coming on board with understanding that COVID is, is a thing that we expect, we expect coverage. And um, so I thought this was a really good sign. And again, I'm gonna have more information on this tomorrow after my webinar. And then I do have a link that's up to date. It's got up to date information dealing with the, the rapidly changing restrictions. And I have a link for that. I was gonna put it on here and they thought, well, maybe not everybody's so interested, but I do have people who have reached out to me. And if you want that link, which is great, um, email me. I'll send it out to you tomorrow morning. Okay. So Kathy. Yep. Um, we had a question in chat from Kelly asking about the Camino de Santiago trail. And for those of you who may not be familiar with that, it's a trail that's a, a, a pilgrimage from France to the coast of Spain. And it's total distance is 500 miles. And it's, it's known for people who travel through these towns, 15 provinces in Spain, um, stay at hostels and walk the entire distance. And it's a religious experience where you're following the foots of St. James and arrive at a cathedral at the end and um, you know, receive your passport stamp. In fact, along the way, you get your passport stamped in the form of a seashell uh, from each location. So, um, Kelly is asking about 30 days, which is even a very good pace for 500 miles of walking. Um, the trip we're talking about doing is with uh, back roads, and it's a taste of the Camino del Santiago Trail. So that's eight days. And for those of you who aren't familiar with back roads, back roads is a hiking, biking, and multi-sport company. And what they're known for is their support vans. And 
So what you would do in this situation, it would be a hike. You would hike um, for a distance, stay overnight. They would transport you to another location. So it's really not doing the full pilgrimage, but giving you a taste of it. Um, no hostels for anything that Kathy Moran does. So there will be hotels that are have real beds and real places to stay. Um, the, uh, um, the thing about it is that there are several highlight locations to see, and that's a good way to get a taste of it. The, uh, the other thing that if you have any interest in it is there's a movie with Martin Sheen called The Way, W-A-Y, where he hikes that trail in memory of his son who passed away while he was trying to do it, in the movie, I mean. Um, and so it, it gives a good uh, flavor of what, what it's about in addition to, uh, I know there are books and clients have come to us about this saying that they want to do this. So that's that's where it started. So Kathy now has the, we're trying to learn uh, Spanish. And so it's the uh, status, which is the other word for status of travel today um, here. But well, I, um, I, I wanted to get back to that question though that Kelly asked is, um, uh, the thing about back roads, if you've taken back roads, you understand, um, you, you really get like three options at the beginning of the day. How do you feel? You know, you can walk minimally, you can have a support van pick you up if you wish. Now, now this pilgrimage, I am really going to try to do the long haul each day if I can. And, um, but certainly for people who just want a taste of it and, and can't feel, you know, that they are able to get through a long day of maybe seven hours of hiking, they don't have to do that at all. So that's the beautiful part of it. And like John mentioned, and you all know me, uh, we're going to stay in nice hotels. I, I mean, I, at, at our age, I can't see, you know, staying in hostels and doing what some of the people do. I mean, that that's just incredible. So I, I think, um, but if you are interested, please reach out to me. Because like I said, we, we've got a lot of interest in that. And I know uh, that this is going to fill up quickly. So... So, that so on that point, Kathy, as well, um, just so that we don't scare people off with the amount of hiking, the longest hike on the, the longest day is only 10 miles. So, you know, the way that these things usually work when you're, you're biking with back roads, you know, you go out in the morning, you stop for lunch, and then you, you continue on in the afternoon. So um, 10 miles uh, sounds like a lot, but when you spread it out over a full, full day, um, separated by lunch is, is really an enjoyable walk. Uh, actually from the countryside that you'll be experiencing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that could take me, no, well, that could take me a significant amount of time. See, when I walk, I like to really enjoy where I'm at and stop and hopefully be able, you know, you're going to have people that are all, from all over the world, which is going to be cool. So you're going to have a lot of different languages. And that's part of the whole experience is that you're going to meet, be meeting up with pilgrims from all over and they all have a story. Uh, John alluded to to a movie that you may want to watch, but they all have a story. And so that that's just going to be a whole nother adventure in and of itself. So um, but to, but to end it all here, you, you've all been the status of travel today. I do see a light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, actually, I started with a brighter light at the end of the tunnel. So. So we're just going to keep our fingers crossed. Everybody be safe. And uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm always available. And uh, I want to thank Karen, who was amazing. And John, you, you really, really great presentation there. So thank you so much to everybody who's on. And, um, you know, hope to all see you live soon. All right. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Be safe.